Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Beatles' Help album, specifically the front cover, and I'm going to show you that it is occultism hidden in plain sight. When I was a younger lad, and I would look at the front cover of the album, I wondered what the Beatles were doing with their arms. I remember back in the day reading that they were spelling out the word help in semaphore. A semaphore is a method of visual signaling, usually by means of flags or lights, and in this case, the Beatles are just using their arms. So if the Beatles were actually spelling out help in semaphore, then George's positioning would be the letter H. John would be E, Paul would be L, and Ringo would be P. Except when you go to a semaphore chart, and they have that on Wikipedia, George's positioning is the letter N. John's is U, Paul's is J, and Ringo's is V. So you can see it's not even close to spelling the word help. In Wikipedia, it tells us that on the UK Parlophone release, which is what we're looking at here, the letters formed by the Beatles appear to be N-U-J-V, which is what I deducted. The slightly rearranged U.S. release on Capitol Records appeared to indicate the letters N-V-U-J. So in either case, they're not spelling out help in semaphores. So the question becomes, if they're not spelling out help in semaphore, what are they doing? And what they're doing is displaying Thelema ritual signs. So if we move to the right-hand side of the chart, we can see the first position, which would be George, is the ritual sign known as Osiris Slain. In the second position, which would be John, that's the ritual sign known as Typhon. And Typhon was also identified with Set who was the Egyptian god of destruction and darkness. In the third position, which would be Paul, that sign is known as Isis Morning. And the last position, Ringo, that ritual sign is referred to as Set Fighting. And all of these ritual signs can be found on the Thelema website. And here's the link here, and I will also drop it down in the description box. So, a logical question to ask would be, why are they doing this? And I think to understand it, we need to go back to the Egyptian story of Osiris, Isis, Set, and Horus. So, to explain that story at a very high level, Osiris ruled over two kingdoms, and during that period of time, there was peace and prosperity. It was essentially a golden age. His wife was Isis. And Set was his younger brother. And Set was envious of Osiris because Set wanted to rule over the two kingdoms. So he battles his brother and he kills Osiris. And not only does he kill him, but he dismembers him and then disperses his body parts throughout the kingdoms. Isis, because her husband has died, goes into mourning. And then she scours the two kingdoms to put Osiris back together, which she's able to do. And we're told she's able to do this because she is a great magician. And we'll touch on this a little later in the presentation. After she puts Osiris back together, she then conceives Horus. And when Horus comes of age, he battles Set. And it is the classic battle between the light and the dark. Horus represents the light or the savior, and Set represents darkness. In fact, the etymology of the word sunset is derived from Set. Okay, so that's a very high level telling of the mythology behind Osiris, Isis, Set, and Horus. So why do I think it's important to understand that story? It's because I think that the album cover of Help is telling that story. So if we look at the sequencing of the ritual signs, and I don't believe it's coincidence, they are in a specific order. We have Osiris slain. Well, who killed Osiris? It was Set or Typhon. When that happens, Isis goes into mourning. And then when Isis puts Osiris back together again and she conceives Horus, then the battle between Horus and Set takes place. And that would be represented by Set 
fighting. And then I had a thought about the title of the album, Help with an exclamation point. So help is a calling out, a mayday for assistance, for help. And who would they be calling out to? To defeat Set. It would be Horus. So I think it's possible that the Help album cover is foretelling the transition from the Eon of Osiris or the Age of Pisces to the Eon of Horus or the Age of Aquarius. Now, there was one part of the story that perplexed me a little bit. Crowley defines the Eon of Osiris which is roughly equivalent to the age of Pisces, as a period of oppression where humanity is shackled. Yet, in Egyptian mythology, the reign of Osiris was peace and prosperity. There's a mismatch. It's disconnected. And then I thought through it some more. When we factor in Set, the reign of Osiris was cut short because Set the god of destruction and darkness, defeats Osiris. So I think it's possible that when Crowley defined his Eon of Osiris, which is roughly equivalent to the Age of Pisces, he was factoring in the entirety of the story of Osiris, Isis, Set, and Horus, where the reign of Osiris began peaceful and with prosperity, but then fell into darkness because Set defeated him. And it's not until Horus comes of age that he's going to battle Set. And as I mentioned before, that's the classic struggle between the light and the dark. Now, I also want to be clear that when I'm discussing this content and presenting it, it does not mean that I am advocating it. It does not mean that I agree with it. In fact, I'm not in agreement with it at all. For those of you who follow my work, you know that my position is that the controllers, who are occultists, everything that they do is inorganic and not natural. They do not follow the natural order. Everything they do is engineered, it's orchestrated, it's manipulated through their occultism which would include magic, rituals, ceremony, alchemy, and so on. And if you think about where we are today, we are living through what? The Great Reset, or the return of Set, the return of the God of Destruction, Chaos, and Darkness. And in the minds of the cultic elite, the only way out is for Horus, the savior god, the god of light, to return and battle set. I know that for a lot of people, this sounds like crazy stuff, but once you understand that the world is controlled by occultists, then it starts to make a lot more sense. Now, before we move on, I'm sure there are those in the audience who are wondering if the Beatles knew that they were displaying ritual signs. And I believe they did not know. They were instructed to show up for the photo shoot. They were told how to position their arms. The photos were taken and then the lads went on their merry way. So I don't think they had any idea what was going on. Okay, so with that, let's move to the next segment, and we're going to talk a little bit more about George Harrison's last album, Brainwashed, and I'm going to show you some additional occultism hidden in plain sight. Alrighty, so this is a slide that I presented going back a few months ago in another presentation, and I called out some of the hidden clues on George Harrison's last album titled Brainwashed. And I'll review the clues very quickly here and then we will move to a new clue that was brought to my attention by Vicky, 
who does our Peppertime presentations, and she asked a question about how the title of the album, Brainwashed, was put together with regard to uppercase and lowercase lettering. But we'll get there in a moment. Now, in my previous presentation, I pointed out that George decided to use five crash dummies to represent the five Beatles, John, Paul, George, Ringo, and Billy. And I also commented that the use of crash dummies was interesting in itself because crash dummies, when you think about it, they don't have a mind of their own and essentially they are props. So if I had to guess, George was telling us that the Beatles were a manufactured entity and there was a machine behind them. Now, if we look to the left of the album cover, we can see that the five crash dummies leave a shadow. But the shadow only has four heads. One, two, three, four. And that represents the four Beatles, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, because you're not supposed to know about Billy. Paul has always been Paul. And what George is telling us is that you are shown an illusion. You're seeing four, but there's really five. So what George is explaining to us here is what you see may not be reality. And again, he's doing this by showing us that there were five Beatles, but you're told there were only four. And then in the center of the five crash dummies, we have a television set. And that is representing brainwashing and mind control. And then we have the pentagrams being displayed with one prominently on the television screen. And so if we read the definition of a pentagram, and this comes to us from a typical online dictionary, a pentagram is a five-pointed star that is formed by drawing a continuous line in five straight segments, often used as a mystic and magical symbol. So even your typical online dictionary tells us that a pentagram is often used as a mystical and magical symbol. Now, the next definition I pulled from the Thelema website, the greater ritual of the pentagram is a fundamental ritual of ceremonial and Thelemic magic. It was originally taught by the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn as a banishing ritual. So that's what I presented in my previous presentation, these clues and these symbols. But there is one that I missed. And as I mentioned when I first started this segment, it was brought to my attention by Vicky. So let's take a look at that now, and I think you're going to find it interesting. Okay, so before I get to the next slide, I wanted to set it up with this chart. Going back several months ago, I posted this post from Ringo on my YouTube community tab on my Paul is Dead channel. And in that post, Ringo says, The drumming on Rain stands out for me because I feel that was someone else playing. I was possessed. And I remember somebody leaving a very funny comment. And they said, yeah, you were possessed, all right, by Bernard Purdy. And that was a reference back to Bernard saying that in the early days, between 1962 and 1966, there were four drummers on the Beatles' recorded tracks, and Ringo was not one of them. But what if Ringo's post has a darker meaning? If we take a look at George's album Brainwashed, we can see that the letters in the title are all in uppercase except A, I, and N. And so he's highlighting the word rain. And why would he do that? Well, let's take a look at a possibility. Okay, so let's take a look at George Harrison's Brainwashed album and try to get some context around why George encoded the word rain into the title of the album, and is that linked back to the post that I showed you where Ringo said that when he, quote, played on the song Rain, he was possessed. And if we look at one of the lyrics from the Beatles song Rain, if the rain comes, they run and hide their heads, they might as well be dead. Now, if you want more information on this topic, I highly recommend you read Daniel Esterlin's book, The Tavistock Institute, Social Engineering, The Masses. It's a great book in general, but in chapter three, titled The Killing of the King, he goes into greater detail 
on Rain Man and Rain. And he has examples from various artists. Most of them are rap artists, but there are also examples from Bob Dylan as an example where the songs talk about Rain Man or Rain. So why did George encode the word Rain in the title of his album Brainwashed? Was it just artistic flair? I don't think so. Because as I mentioned in the previous slide, all of the letters in the title of the album are in uppercase, except A, I, and N. And when George did that, he highlighted the word rain. So what does that mean? So using Daniel's book as a source, also a website that I found, and the link is right here, and it will also be in the description box below. You can read it for yourself. We get this information. The Rain Man, or Rain, is a demonic entity reported to be the corrupting influence behind the music industry who makes deals with those who aspire to make it big in the industry. The word umbrella is also synonymous with the Rain Man. The word umbrella is derived from a Latin word meaning shadow or under the influence of umbra. It can also be used in reference to a paranormal entity such as a ghost. And of course, we have the shadows on George's album. And on the Beatles' 65 album, all four Beatles are holding umbrellas. And if you do a search for Beatles and umbrella, you're going to find a number of images where the Beatles are holding umbrellas. Many believe Rain Man is connected to Baphomet, a demonic entity from occult folklore, though it is also likely that the Rain Man is a different being entirely while representing a higher power. I don't see this as any different than going to the crossroads, uh, making a deal with the devil, entering into a Faustian bargain, or what Bob Dylan called making a deal with the chief commander. And is that what George is telling us, that the Beatles entered into a Faustian bargain? In memoirs, it tells us that John and Paul entered into a pact in October of 1963. In the book, Lenin Prophecy by Joseph Nisgoda, Joseph theorizes that John Lennon may have entered into a pact in December of 1960. And that pact ran for 20 years. So if we do the math, 20 years from December 1960 takes us to December of 1980. And of course, John was assassinated in December of 1980. Also, there was an attempt on George Harrison's life going back to December 30th, 1999. He was almost stabbed to death by a 33-year-old man 33, at 3.30 a.m. in the morning, 33, and George at the time was 56 years old. 5 plus 6 equals 11. And there's also occulted numerology embedded in the date. December, 1 plus 2 is 3. On the 30th date, 3 plus 0 is 3. 33, in 1999, 999. And if we flip the 9s, we have 666. Six, six. So I think George by embedding and encoding the word rain within the title of his last album, Brainwashed, was telling us that the Beatles made the pact. They signed on the dotted line. They came to an agreement with the chief commander. And when I go to the next slide, I'm going to walk you through some additional occult symbolism that I think goes hand in hand with what I'm showing you here. Now, before I go to the next chart, I also want to be clear that I am not insinuating that every song that contains the word rain, either in the title or the lyrics, means that that artist or that band has made a deal with the devil. My wife and I co-wrote a song titled Rainy Day, and we did not enter into a Faustian bargain. So we have to be smart about this as well. But when we see situations like what George has done here, where he has clearly embedded the word rain into the title of his album, then that's worth inspection. Now, 
if an artist has the words Rain Man in the lyrics or in the title, then that's probably relevant. And we also have to look at it within the context of the level of occult symbolism around that band or that group. And also, how prominent are they in the music industry or in the entertainment industry? Okay, so I just wanted to make that point. And so with that, let's move to the next slide and let's talk about Ringo and his peace signs. Okay, slide number 17. And I realize it is a busy chart, but I will walk you through it step by step. So let's start on the left-hand side and let's get some mainstream definitions of the peace sign. The symbol was designed by Gerald Holtham for the British nuclear disarmament movement. The symbol is a superimposition of the flag semaphore for the characters N and D, taken to stand for nuclear disarmament. In 1968, the anti-communist evangelist Billy James Hargis described the symbol as a broken cross which he claimed represented the Antichrist. Hargis's interpretation was taken up by a member of the John Birch Society, Marjorie Jensen, who wrote a pamphlet claiming the symbol was equivalent to a symbol of the devil. So that's the origins of the peace symbol representing the broken cross. That's where it came from. But I'm going to focus on the two-finger symbolism. So what is the possible occult meaning of the peace sign? Is the two-finger peace sign a symbolic reference to Vav, the Hebrew consonant for V, which is the sixth letter of the modern Hebrew language? In modern Hebrew, the word Vav, which in ancient Hebrew was Wa, is used to mean hook or a nail. Vav in gematria represents the number six. Nail symbolism can mean securing, protecting, fastening, as well as suffering and sacrifice. And if we look to the left, I have an image showing what the Hebrew letter Vav looks like. And again, it is the sixth letter, and it is associated with a hook or a nail. The nail is often associated in the Christian tradition with the crucifixion of Christ, and thus symbolizes his passion. Christ was nailed to the cross. Relics that are claimed to be the holy nails with which Jesus was crucified are objects of veneration among some Christians, particularly Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox. In 2 Enoch, the Slavonic interpretation, the leader of the watches, otherwise known as the Gregory or fallen angels, is Satan nail. So the first question, is the VP sign mocking Christianity? In memoirs it states, Crowley introduced the symbol to Winston Churchill, V for victory. Or does it really mean conquest of the Eon of Osiris and securing the Eon of Horus? V is also a representation of the master number 11. The double V is the master number 22, which is a powerful number known for its transformative power turning desires and dreams into reality. V is also the 22nd letter in the English alphabet and 22 is associated with the master architect and the master builder representing manifestations and creations. And then I ask my second question. Does the double V represent the sigil of Satan? So if we go to the middle of the chart at the top, we have Ringo making the double V sign, V sign number one and V sign number two. Below him is the sigil of Satan. And you can see I have it numbered. So number one is the first V at the bottom of the sigil. Number two is the second V. And we can see it's an upside down triangle. And then within the second V, we have another V. And also note the hooks or crooks at the bottom of the sigil. And I'll talk about the crook in a little bit, especially as it pertains to Billy. So, the satanic sigil contains three V's, and here, Vav in Gematria represents the number six. So, we have six, six, six. But if we focus on the two primary V's, 
then that is representative of the occult number 66. And here I have an image of Billy making two V's with his hands. And not only does he do that, but he took the time to trim his facial hair so that there's a V on both sides of his face. <laughs> okay, so all of this, folks, this is not coincidence. Now, let's move over to the image on the right where we have George hammering nails into John's head. And we can see how George has the nails positioned. He's holding the nails in the shape of two V's. Here's V number one and V number two. So what is being displayed here is the sigil of Satan. And the Google Play icon, which I rotated to show you that it is also the sigil of Satan. Here's the first V at the bottom of the sigil. And here is the second V, the larger V, the upside down triangle. Now, going back to my two questions, is the VP sign mocking Christianity? I believe the answer to that is yes. And does the double V represent the sigil of Satan? And I think the answer to that is yes as well. So here we have another example, and I think this is a pretty big example of the Beatles as an entity being immersed in occultism. To me, this is very, very obvious as to what's going on here. Okay. And with that, let's move to slide 18 and talk a little bit more about Egypt and how that ties into the Beatles and Billy in particular. Okay. So this is a slide that I presented before and I put it together in order to give an overview of how the controllers, the cultic elite, plan on moving the world from the Piscean Age or the Eon of Osiris to the Aquarian Age or the Eon of Horus. And again, as they have defined that new age or that new eon. I have explained on many occasions that the world is controlled by occultists and that occultism has a foundation in the Egyptian mysteries and in Babylon as well. And so on the left-hand side of the chart, that's Horus, and he represents the crucified, sacrificed, resurrected Messiah, Savior, and Liberator. And it's based in paganism. And if we move to the center of the slide with the image of Jesus, that's the Piscean Age, or the Eon of Osiris, and the predominant religious structure was Christianity, or monotheism. So in the Piscean Age, Jesus has the role as the crucified, sacrificed, resurrected Messiah, Savior, and Liberator. Now, to move from the Eon of Osiris to the Eon of Horus, a couple of things have to happen. There has to be a breaking down, a dismantling of the existing structure. So the existing structure would be the Eon of Osiris or the Piscean Age. And in alchemy, in order to bring in the new, you can't have any remnants of the old. And the Beatles play a very, very significant role in that dismantling process. In fact, I refer to the Beatles as the Pied Pipers of the Eon of Horus, and we'll get into the Pied Piper and Pan in just a moment. The basic concepts at a high level of what the cultic elite, the controllers, believe philosophically and spiritually goes back to Aleister Crowley, that man is a god. And I have concluded that the majority of those in the Pyramid of Power subscribe to Crowley's religion of Thelema, which is Luciferianism, which is based in paganism. So in order to make the transition from the Eon of Osiris or the Piscean Age to the Eon of Horus or the Age of Aquarius, some things have to happen in order to break down the old structures. So morals, ethics, and basic beliefs, traditional beliefs, needed to be reshaped. Non-traditional values would be introduced, thus breaking away from traditional values. 
there would be a breaking away from institutionalized religion, and in particular, Christianity, because Christianity is the dominant spiritual religious belief system of the Piscean Age. And if they're going to move to the Aquarian Age or the Eon of Horus, then Christianity has to go away. And this is all done through social engineering, which includes free love, drugs, and so on. And in order to facilitate this dismantling, based upon the philosophy and the ideology of the cultic elite, which goes back to the Egyptian mysteries, there's a particular player that needs to be introduced into the process. That player is set. I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the Great Reset means the return of set. And if we look at the splash screen from Peter Jackson's documentary, Get Back, look at the G. It's an S. Set back. Or set is back. And the Beatles, as the Pied Pipers of the Eon of Horus, are setting the table for the return of Horus to battle Set. Set is the god of destruction, chaos, and darkness. And once Horus prevails, then peace and prosperity will return. And that will be the Aquarian Age, or the Eon of Horus. And again, what I'm explaining is based upon my understanding of the controller's spiritual ideology, which goes back to the Egyptian mysteries. And in memoirs, it explains that Paul and Billy are reenacting the Osiris Horus ritual, which needs to happen in order for Horus to return. And not only that, but the book tells us that the cultic elite are positioning Paul McCartney as a messiah savior figure. In other words, he becomes Horus. And if we go to John's song, I found out, he has a lyric in there that says, I've seen religions from Jesus to Paul. And I know this sounds like crazy stuff. But once you understand that we're controlled by occultists, then perhaps this makes more sense. So what I'm going to do now is to read the footnote in memoirs on page 557, which explains where they're going with this. Okay, so bear with me one second. Okay, so I had to put my readers on. If the plan continues to be as successful as it has thus far, centuries from now, when people reverently discuss Vishnu's avatars who transform the world, they will primarily speak of Krishna, Jesus, and Paul. So we can put Vishnu and Krishna in the same category as Horus, a Messiah, Savior, Liberator God. Consider how little was written about Jesus in the early centuries of his Christian era, and by contrast, how much more Paul was already promoted before his age of Aquarius began. The work to establish him as a Christ figure is unparalleled. Based on the current rate of progress, those working to deify their Messiah in the collective consciousness expect to reach critical mass much faster than it took Jesus' followers. Over time, Paul's media-driven veneration will include mystical faith-promoting stories. Convincing the world that Paul is the true avatar of this Eon of Horus will confirm the validity of Crowley's prophecies. Vindicating Crowley as a true prophet empowers those holding the reins of Paulism just as Christianity empowered the Pope and the Holy Roman Empire. Paulism is one branch of a larger tree that will create the illusion of choice, each being free to choose his or her own branch, but with every option controlled by the same people who also control politics and wealth in the New World Order. Upon William's death, the illuminated will eulogize Paul as the god of music. The profane will hear the epithet, but understand it metaphorically as with Elvis, the king of rock, or Michael, the king of pop. After the massive depopulation, a generation of literalists will emerge. They will turn against their unbelieving parents to proclaim Paul's divinity. Paul will be recognized as the Messiah, with Aleister Crowley as his prophet. Dissenters will call Paul an antichrist, 
not in the same sense of opposing Jesus, but for replacing him. Crowley opposes, will say, is a false prophet. Most devotees will say that Paul, who is Krishna, or Horus, was born a god, an incarnation of Vishnu, and that he lived to a ripe old age. Others will say he was born mortal, but obtained a fullness of divinity by degrees as he grew in light and knowledge. The illuminated will secretly pass on the great mystery that Paul embodied gods that continued in William, reenacting Osiris and Horus. Such William mythology will offend those who feel it diminishes Paul's independent divinity. However, the same stories will inspire the elect. So there you go. And with that, let's move to slide number 19 and talk a little bit about ISIS. Okay, so a big shout out to Wendy Stone, who is a fellow researcher and colleague. Wendy has participated in a couple of the memoirs roundtables, and she sent me the image that you see on the right and said, Mike, I think you might find this interesting. And indeed, it is very interesting. So let's jump right in. Does Son of the Magician mean Alistair Crowley is Billy's biological father? Perhaps not. The Egyptian goddess Isis is known as the Big Magician or Great Magician, whose power transcended that of all other gods. Based on Egyptian lore, if Billy, in his mind, is an incarnation of Horus, then Isis is his mother, and that is how he became the son of the magician. In memoirs, we're told that Billy, a.k.a. Paul McCartney, was mentored by Aleister Crowley for 10 years. And that 10-year period of time started in 1937 when Billy was born through 1947 when Aleister Crowley passed away. In the book, Billy refers to Crowley as Father Crowley. But if the connection back to Isis is the reason why he is referred to as the son of the magician, then the reference to Father Crowley is connected back to Crowley's religion of Thelema and is not parental. Now, could Billy still be bloodlined to Crowley? I believe that that is very possible because within the pyramid of power, it's all about bloodlines. So Wendy's discovery certainly drops a monkey wrench into the premise that Billy's biological father was Alistair Crowley. I thought it was possible based upon Crowley's propensity for sex magic. And I was thinking maybe that was the way that Billy was conceived. But I was also careful not to make any declarations. In other words, stating that Crowley was indeed Billy's biological father. And the reason why I did not make that leap was because I did not have enough evidence to link Billy directly back to Alistair Crowley. Now, that being said, it does not mean that Crowley was not extremely influential in Billy's life. I think the evidence for that is very clear. Now, coincidentally, there was another researcher that contacted me a few months ago, and they have been looking into Billy's family tree. They picked up on a clue in memoirs that took them down a different path, away from Crowley and in another direction. And they shared some of their research with me, and it supports the premise that Crowley is not Billy's biological father. The research also says that perhaps Billy is not a Wallace, he's not a Shepherd, or a Campbell. And so I asked this researcher if they would be open to presenting their findings, and they agreed. And so we're scheduled to connect in September to put a show together. And I think you'll find it very, very interesting. Okay, so stay tuned. And so with that, let's move to slide number 20, and let's talk about the shepherd's crook and Osiris. Okay, so Osiris and the shepherd's crook, and I asked the question, is Set the Flail and Horus the Crook. And I'll get to that in a moment. If we look to the image on the right, we have the McCartney character, and I'm referring to him as a character because that doesn't look like Billy to me. It's certainly not biological, Paul. So my bet is that is a double. For starters, his hair is parted 
on the wrong side of his head and the nose is different. But be that as it may, if we go along his left arm, we could see the shepherd's crook or hook. And if you do a search, you'll find a number of pictures where the McCartney character is holding the shepherd's crook. And we'll talk about what that means in a moment. To the right is an image of Osiris. And we can see Osiris in his right hand going diagonally across his chest to his right shoulder is holding the flail. And in his left hand, he has the shepherd's crook, which goes diagonally across his chest and up toward his left shoulder, and it forms an X. And with Egyptian symbolism, the X represents Osiris risen. And here's an image from the Thelema website for the Osiris risen ritual sign, which refers to resurrection. And we can see the arms are crossed. And if you do a search on the internet for celebrities and entertainers, and you type in Osiris risen, you're going to see a ton of images. Up above is the new logo for Twitter. So we can see that Twitter is also using the Osiris risen symbolism. So when I said earlier that Egyptian symbolism is ubiquitous, it is. It's everywhere. Once you know what to look for, you're going to see it everywhere. Now, if we go back to the Egyptian story between Osiris and Horus, we're told that Horus shares the same essence or soul as Osiris. And we are told the same thing in memoirs with regard to Billy's relationship with biological Paul McCartney. In the book, Tom tells us that Paul and Billy are reenacting the Osiris Horus ritual, and Paul has the role of Osiris, and Billy has the role of Horus. And in the book, Billy tells us that he has this spiritual, supernatural connection to Paul, where he can sense Paul within him. The point I'm making is the relationship between Billy and Paul is very similar to the relationship between Horus and Osiris. And I guess we could say, well, maybe that's because they're following a script, right? And that could very well be, but I would argue that that script is the reenactment of the ritual. So let's take a moment now and learn about the shepherd's crook and the flail. And we're also going to see how Billy's aliases, whether it be Shears or Shepherd, play into the crook. So let me take a moment and read what I have here on the left-hand side of the chart. The source is this link here, which will be in the description box if you wish to take a look for yourself. Becoming an Osiris. The crook and the flail are related to the great work of spiritual transformation, meaning mastery of the lower animal self. And when we talk about the great work in alchemy, it's known as the magnum opus. The crook and flail staffs were tools every Egyptian seeker used to transform his or her lower animal self into a servant of his or her higher spiritual self. And I noted the lower animal self with the number six. Six represents man or woman in the physical or material world. And seven represents spiritual transformation or enlightenment. The crook was used by shepherds. The hook of the crook served to hold a runaway sheep. The crook symbolized the concept of rule, and it serves as the hieroglyph for the Egyptian word rule or ruler. However, rather than ruling over others, the crook seems to have also conveyed the idea of ruling one's lower self by gently guiding one's own behavior upward. So again, the number six the physical world or the physical plane upward would be the number seven to the spiritual realm of enlightenment. The flail was a simple agricultural tool used for threshing or beating grain, and it was also a weapon. Yet here, it's a weapon one might use on their own lower nature to aggressively whip one's lower self into line. This is how one becomes an Osiris. Occultists will quickly note that the two opposing and yet complementary concepts described here, 
mercy, meaning the crook, and severity, the flail, play a key role across various occult schools. Mercy is conveyed by the crook, as the crook is a merciful way to gently guide a straying animal back to the fold. Severity is conveyed by the flail, as the flail is a severe way to reprimand a rebellious animal and force that animal back into line. In this way, these two tools help to mercifully and severely guide the lower animal that is you, your lower animal self. So after I read this, I thought to myself, okay, so Billy in this Horus Osiris role, because remember, Horus possesses the essence of Osiris, sees himself as the good shepherd. He has his shepherd's crook, and he's going to be merciful, and he's going to lead the flock or the herd to the promised land, to enlightenment. Now, for those that don't buy into the program, for those that don't buy into the Eon of Horus and the controller's version of the Age of Aquarius, then they're going to have to be flailed, <laughs> right? So that, in my mind, represents set. So through the chaos and through the dysfunction, that's how people who are not going along with the program are going to be forced to march in a certain direction. So if we think about what has taken place over the last three years, if you didn't do X, Y, and Z, then there were consequences. And some might be asking, hey, Mike, do you have any idea who's playing the role of set? I don't know. Perhaps it's Klaus Schwab. But what I do see happening is this occult concept of the crook and the flail playing out. Okay, so with that, let's move to slide number 21, and let's talk about Pan. Alrighty, so we're going to talk about Pan, and before I get started, I want to thank Sally for the Billy Pan connection. And we have words in our language that goes back to the mythological gods, such as panic, pandemonium, pandemic. So Pan has an underpinning within our culture. So to get started, let's take a look at the right-hand side of the slide and we have Pan leaping over a fence. It's the top right picture and then below that we have Billy in the same exact pose and he's leaping over a car. Is this coincidence? I don't think so. So Billy's making a connection back to Pan. Also we have the word rain appearing again. This time as part of the title of Billy's album, Driving Rain. And then we have an image of Crowley, and this comes from the cover of a book titled Alistair Crowley and the Cult of Pan. I ordered the book, I haven't read it yet, but I am very interested to dig in to get some more information with regard to the connections between Crowley and the Cult of Pan. And then below that, we have the lads in their Sergeant Pepper outfits, and I will talk about that in a moment. Okay, so with that, let's get some background on Pan. In ancient Greek religion and mythology, Pan is the god of the wild, shepherds and flocks, rustic music and impromptus, and companion of the nymphs. He has the hindquarters, legs, and horns of a goat. He is also recognized as the god of fields, groves, wooden glens, and often affiliated with sex. Because of this, Pan is connected to fertility and the season of spring. So just within the first paragraph, we have the word shepherd popping up again, shepherds and flocks. And then when I read that he is the god of fields, groves, and wooded glens, that reminded me of Billy's song, Mother Nature's Son. The word pandemonium today refers to a place of chaos and confusion. John Milton, in his 1667 epic poem, Paradise Lost, coined the word pandemonium. Milton's use of the word did not mean a place of utter chaos, but ironically, a peaceful council for fallen angels where they would plan their vengeance on God. In other words, pandemonium literally means chaos on earth, but order in hell. Pan is also similar to the Greek god Dionysus and his satyr companions, 
who were usually depicted drunk or in a state of sexual arousal. For Dionysus, spirituality came in the form of intoxication through wine, causing a form of ecstasy, stepping outside oneself to join nature as a whole. Pan, on the other hand, was void of any spiritual essence and advocated stepping inside oneself and into the unconscious dream world. Pan forced people to cross over into the unconscious world, a world distorted by repressed sexual desire and primitive fear. When I read this, this sounded very Crowley-like to me. And what I mean by that is, Crowley essentially believed that humans, especially when we talk about the eon of Osiris, were living in an unconscious state. They were not enlightened. They were not illuminated. They were oppressed and shackled. So with that comes repressed sexual desire, primitive fears, and so on. And of course, he believes that by transitioning from the Eon of Osiris to the Eon of Horus, that repression goes away and humans will become enlightened because they will be pursuing their pure or true will. Okay? Another interesting note, I found this in Wikipedia. Pan had a battle with Typhon, and as I mentioned earlier, Typhon is set, so there is a pan Horus connection. What that is specifically, I haven't figured it out. Maybe when I read the book, Alistair Crowley and the Cult of Pan, I'll have some more information. Also, I wanted to mention that Jack Parsons of Jet Propulsion Laboratory fame, or JPL, who was also a Crowley disciple and a cultist, recited the Hymn of Pan before any rocket launch. And Jack Parsons was a very strange duck. <laughs> okay. All right, let's talk about the Pied Piper now. And the Pied Piper is a variation on the mythology of Pan. The town of Hamlin was plagued by an unusual number of rats and a stranger from out of town wearing multicolored or pied clothes showed up and offered to get rid of the rats in exchange for payment. The stranger then produced a flute or pipe and began playing a tune. When he played, all the rats followed him out through the gates of the city and either to a nearby mountain or into the river, depending upon which version you encounter. When the townspeople saw how easily the piper had rid the town of rats, they regretted the amount they had offered to pay him and reneged on their deal. The piper vowed revenge, and according to one brother's grim account, he returned and once more walked through the town playing his pipe. This time, all the town's 130 children followed him out through the town's east gate and up to the nearby mountain, which in most accounts opened wide to swallow them up and they disappeared, never to be seen again. And that's what happens when you don't pay the piper. So, going back to the Pied Piper wearing multicolored or pied clothes. Let's take a look at the Sergeant Pepper outfits. Is it a reference back to the Pied Piper? I'll let you decide. Also, another variation of the Pan mythology is Peter Pan. And whenever I read the Peter Pan story, it takes me back to the fool card of the tarot deck. So the point I'm making, at least in my mind, is all of this stuff is intertwined. It's very elaborate, the way it's all stitched together. Okay, so with that, let's move to the next slide. And I'm going to play that interview that Billy did last year, where he talks about driving a herd or a flock of sheep through the city of London. And that ties back to the shepherd's crook that I took everybody through, as well as Pan. So let's go there now and take a listen. Okay, so here's the interview from March of 2022. Let's take a listen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Woo! Ooh, ooh. <sighs> nice to see you. Nice to see you, Mark. Sir Paul McCartney. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, now, being a knight. Yeah. What, what does that enable you to do? Like, can you go to the British Museum and take out armor? Uh... No, 
but I can drive a herd of sheep through the city of London. That really? That, yeah. <laughs> that's a real thing. Well, what, what it is, they give you the freedom. It's slightly different. They give yeah. you the freedom of the city. Yeah. And uh, my daughter, Stella, said, what, what is it? You know, did you get anything? I said, I don't know. I'm going to think. I don't know. So she looked it up here, and she said, yeah, it is. I am entitled to drive a flock of sheep through the city of London. I'm surprised Capital didn't think of that for a publicity thing. <laughs> this time. <laughs> there you go, folks. You cannot make this stuff up. Okay, so with that, let's move to the next slide, and let's talk about Billy's juju eyeball. Okay, so earlier in the presentation, I explained that Billy is blind in his right eye, and he has an ocular prosthetic, and he only has vision in his left eye. And before Sally made the discovery about Billy's right eye, I used to wonder about the lyric, he got juju eyeball, in the Beatles song, Come Together. What did it mean? So let's take a look at what juju means. Juju is an object that has been deliberately infused with magical power or the magical power itself. Juju operates on the principle of spiritual contagious contact based on physical contact. The underlying belief is that two entities that have been in close contact have similar properties even after being separated. It then becomes possible to manipulate one in order to reach the other. This is essentially what Billy is telling us in the memoirs of Billy Shears, where he explains that he has this otherworldly spiritual connection with biological Paul, and Paul's essence or his spirit resides within Billy, and they are essentially sharing the same physical body, that they are one. Part of Billy is Billy, and the other part of him is Paul. Thus, in that context, a person's hair, fingernails, a piece of clothing, a shoe, a sock, or a piece of jewelry worn by them are all perfect candidates for juju because they are believed to retain the spiritual aura of their owner. Again, in memoirs, Billy tells us that when he met the McCartney family after Paul's death, that he was given articles of Paul's clothing. And so when I read this, I started to connect some dots. Likewise, it is thought that spiritual similarity can be created by deliberately placing two things in physical contact. The underlying belief is that spiritual assimilation and fusion will take place, with one entity absorbing the qualities of the other. And this goes back to what I just said, where... Billy believes that he shares the spiritual essence of biological Paul McCartney, making them one. So I'm going to say that the lyric, he got juju eyeball and come together, was a clue. And it's a clue that covers two angles. The first being that Billy has an artificial eye. He's blind in his right eye. The second is another reference to the occultism that surrounds the Beatles as an entity. And so with that, let's move to the next slide and take a look at another clue about Billy's right eye. This time it comes up in a recent video upload by the YouTube channel, I Am A Phony. Let's take a look. Okay, so this clue came to me from a listener and I forgot to write their YouTube handle down, so I apologize, but please stake your claim down below in the comments section. And as I mentioned, it has to do with a recent upload by I Am A Phony, and it's a song that is sung by John Lennon, and it's called I Know It's True. And the listener said, hey Mike, take a look at the 1 minute 38 second mark. Paul has a deformed eye. So I took a screen capture of the image at the 1 minute 38 second mark, and lo and behold, there is something going on with the eye. It looks deformed. We can see it's closed and it's encircled. And it's bringing attention to the eye. And what is the message? I believe the message is confirming that Billy is blind in that right eye. And I refer to this image as the McCartney character because it's clearly not biological Paul. 
it appears to me to be a hybrid between Paul and Billy. Take a look at the chin. Man, you let your face grow long. The lyric from I Am the Walrus. Also, 1 minute 38 seconds, if we break that time down in numerology, we have a minute 38 equals 1 plus 3 plus 8, which equals 12, which equals 1 plus 2, which equals 3. And of course, we have Billy's recent album, McCartney 3. 3 represents the triple sevens. 3 times 7 is 21. 2 plus 1 equals 3. The triple sevens are associated with Alistair Crowley, which is associated with his lightning flash of creation. And if you want to learn more about the lightning flash of creation, I will have this link down in the description box below.